He used to kick footballs. Now he kicks ass. He's Pat McAfee, host of the Pat McAfee Show, along with A.J. Hawk on YouTube and Sirius XM, the uh, former punter for the Colts. Uh, more likely to get injured punting or being a combatant in WWE? Hey, Dan, thanks for having me on. Yeah. Uh, thanks for always being a trailblazer. You know, I mean, you're such a smooth talking guy and you have such a big brain. Like whenever you did that read for Link Soul before you went to break there, I was on here. I was like, damn, I need that stuff. You know what I mean? Like I was like, damn, I need some Link Soul. And did you say laser fitted some sort of thing in that whole? I'm like, yeah. damn, I need Link Soul. And then you just cut a promo for Benzo there on the other side. I'm like, oh, I think we need to buy him. You're costing me a lot of money, Dan. It's because of how good you are at your job. So I appreciate the invite. Any Anytime Fritzy's name pops up on my cell phone, I get excited because obviously we take, um, you know, great pride in the fact that we're in this daily sports talk world and you're obviously a pioneer of it. So thank you for the invite here. Uh, with that being said, almost died a couple of times at SummerSlam on Saturday, Dan. That's uh, And I've never almost <laughs> died punting. So I, I would go with SummerSlam and WWE as opposed to punting, but both certainly a lot of fun, a blast in high anxiety situations. But if I talk to you at 12, do you want to be a punter or would you want to be in WWE? WWE, for sure. I never wanted to be a punter. I mean, obviously nobody, you, you <laughs> fall to punter, Dan. I mean, we all know that, you know, you've never, you've never, uh, went up to a kid and said, Hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they say, like, like astronaut or a cop or a fireman or a baseball player or football, but nobody goes, I want to be a punter in the NFL because if you have dreams or dreams or aspirations of being a punter, you probably kick the hell out of a football or a ball. Yeah. So you probably want to be a soccer player, you know? And if you're in a wide receiver or a quarterback or a tight end that inevitably ends up being a punter, that's because your team told you like, Hey, this position ain't going to work for you. You should probably go try fourth downs and punting balls. So at 12, definitely want to be a WWE superstar. My entire life, I wanted to be a WWE superstar. That's really the longest dream I've ever had. Getting to play in the NFL was a massive, massive honor. So thankful for that. But WWE has been the thing that I've wanted my entire life, Dan. Were you a position player before you became a punter? No, I was a uh, soccer player. I'd show up on Fridays. I'd just kind of walk in with the fans. The first game, I had no idea really how to put on my pads. I walked in with our student section because I had a soccer game before it. I uh, walked across the field, had really no idea what was going on, just started bombing balls like I was the guy, Nigel, from replacements. I, um, I, I was very fortunate to grow up in Pittsburgh, a football town. So growing up, I played a lot of football on the streets and backyards and things like that. NFL was my favorite sport to watch, but I was supposed to be a soccer player and then football. Ball just happened after a punt, pass, and kick national championship, and I happen to have a cannon attached to my right hip. When did it change for you in this business? When did it click that you went from a somebody who wanted to do it, you were doing stand-up comedy, like you're trying to figure all this out after your career, but then it clicked. What changed? I don't know, Dan. Honestly, I have no idea. I think when I was playing in the NFL, I was doing all this stuff. So... I had a podcast when I was in the NFL. I did uh, a one stand-up comedy tour with a couple other side shows while I was in the NFL. I had a merch business while I was in the NFL. I, um, was, I, I was very fortunate to do, uh, do the Bob and Tom show weekly when I was in the NFL as well. So I kind of got a chance to dabble in a lot of different stuff while I was still playing. And when you're a punter, you're able to do that. You know, there's no addendums going into any punter contracts about watching more film outside of the facility. So with less mental management on the plate for me for being a punter, I was able to do a lot of stuff. And I just started getting real fulfillment from everything I was doing off the field. And I found out that there was a business side to it as well, that I can maybe make some money off the field as well. So once I kind of reset everybody's finances around my family and friends the nfl i was super pumped to be there but i knew that afterwards i was going to enjoy life as well and i've obviously gotten incredibly lucky with this entire run thus far but i remember we had you on after you made your decision that might have been the houston super bowl and I, you said you could still punt but you were done like how mentally do you get to the point where you go i'm done with this i don't know I mean, it's just like 
punting, like you said, whenever you're 12 years old, do you think about punting? No. Like even in college, I was a kicker first before I was a punter. I became a punter basically out of necessity and we're doing the rugby punt, which was a roll out to the right. And I was just trying to line drive it as far as possible. We'd be in games and I have nothing but respect for all the punters in the NFL. I love them. I put them over every single weekend because it's not an easy thing to do. It is a difficult thing to do. You don't really get a chance to bounce back either. If you have a bad rep, you got to go sit on that for like 35 minutes but in the fourth quarter you know you're down 21 like a punter can't do anything like i'm just standing there i'm along for the ride just like everybody else in soccer i was like a point man on basically every team i was on even when i was kicking at west virginia and punting at west virginia i was at least in the game it just got to a point where after eight years I got a chance to get really good at the craft. I got to learn a lot. I got to experience great teams and great teammates. And I understand the value of field position in the sport that I've watched my entire life and didn't really fully comprehend. Uh, but I just, my brain is super active, super active every day. I'm sitting in there because there's not a lot of film for us to watch as punters. So I'm playing cornhole for like three hours in a locker room where everybody else is watching film and doing all that. And my brain is just running with like a thousand ideas. Like I should be doing this. I should be doing this. I could be doing this. I could be doing this. And you always think the grass is greener on the other side. You never truly know. So for like three years, I contemplated retiring and just kind of attacking life outside of football. And I don't think it was until, you know, kind of took care of everybody. You know, me and the GM didn't get along. He didn't like, he didn't think I was funny. I mean, that was, that was very, pretty apparent. He did not, <laughs> he did not enjoy me. It just, there was, a, I was staring down another knee surgery. It just felt like, it just felt like the universe was telling me, Dan, you know, and obviously it could have got to a point where the universe was completely wrong. And I still feel like I could probably go punt for a couple of teams if I wanted to. Uh, and that would probably last for at least another few years as I'm almost, hey, I'm almost 40 now. I mean, I'm 35, but damn, I'm getting old, Dan. So, I don't know. I just I felt like the universe told me the timing was right, and um, I was I got very fortunate with the team I had. I mean, it was just it was the perfect timing, and I'm very very fortunate for it all. He's Pat McAfee, host of the Pat McAfee Show, and a former Colts punter. What was your reaction? And um, I guess immediate reaction when you heard that Andrew Luck was going to retire. So I was watching at home just like everybody else, right? And uh, I mean, that's what he comes out of nowhere. Fourth quarter preseason game. Oh, and then the, obviously the stadium, there's a couple hundred people in there still who have made it through a preseason game uh, to the fourth quarter, one in which Andrew Luck was not playing, who is our franchise player. So maybe a little boozed up, we could assume, and they boo Andrew on his way out. And I think it was more so booing the situation, not Andrew, because I've never met anybody in Indianapolis that didn't have the utmost respect for Andrew Luck because – I got to see it firsthand. You know, that dude took an ass beating. I mean, just on a regular basis. And it was just his style of play. And he would thank everybody that hit him. And he never got too fired up with people that would obviously blatantly miss blocks for him to get hit. I've always said I thought he was too nice of a guy. The most talented, most talented person I think I've ever seen. His brain is so large. You have to use context clues just to kind of keep up with conversations with him, right? I'm a, I'm an idiot, but that it really felt like that. He was so smart, so incredibly smart, so athletic. He was so good at quarterback. He understood the playbook quicker than anybody else. He had a photographic memory. He's fast. He's tough. He's all these things. I just think his style of play and him not being a, a mean enough person. Like I always said, I wish he could watch Peyton for one year. If he could have watched Peyton, not that Peyton was mean, but Peyton demanded and commanded respect and also like, hey, this is a business. This is who I want to do business with. Andrew was still like, hey, I'm a high school college football player at the beginning. Uh, you do the coaching. You do the deciding. I'll do the playing. I wish he would have took a little bit more ownership, which I think he did towards the end of his career, which is a natural thing. Uh, but I was lucky to watch that guy. And my first reaction whenever he retired was, damn, the league is going to miss him because of how explosive and electrifying he was on the field. The Kyler Murray story, you got Deshaun Watson's story. Like, how do you pick and choose what you dive into and what you don't on your show? How do you guys do it, Dan? What do you guys do? I find, and I, I ask the Danettes, I just say, what are you hot on? Because if, if we are hot on it, then I, then I think, you know, I can buy into it or vice versa, and then the audience is going to trust you because they tune in already trusting you. And I think that what I want to know is what is something that's really important to somebody here? Because, if you know, we could go down the list and go, is anybody interested in that? Nah. How about that? Nah. Oh, that. And then the room reacts. And then I sort of take, I grab that. That's the baton. And then I take it. And then it's up to me to run the, uh, you know, four by 400. 
Well, and you do that very well, by the way. You run the hell out of the thing like a gazelle. But the, I think that's the right move because you guys are so established in the OGs in this whole thing. You know, you guys are the trendsetters. So Rich Rodriguez gave uh, a motivational speech to our team one time, and he said he wants a team full of thermostats, you know, not thermometers. You know, we set the temperature. We don't tell it. And it was like, it was so profound whenever he said it. And I assume we were getting, I assume we we're getting yelled at for it, but I, I found that to be like such a profound statement. And I think when we were starting, we were trying to look at what everybody else was talking about. You know, we were trying to watch every other sports talk show who we assumed had better scouts, better producers, more equipped to talk about what we should be talking about. And that lasted, I don't know, probably four months, five months. And then we got to the point where, much like you, we go, All right, what do we want to talk about? You know, and if if our conversations are good, like if you build it, they will come is kind of the hopes. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes we miss some stuff that everybody else is chatting about strictly because we're either too dumb to talk about that particular thing or it literally never came up in our universe and we completely missed it. Would you use steroids in the WWE to make your body look you know, like like Ultimate Warrior, like you know, one of those. I mean, I can see you, you're kind of jacked, jacked. Thank you, kind of, kind of jacked. But you God. know, but like an actor, you know, these guys in Hollywood, they'll use performance enhancing drugs. You're an actor with WWE. Would you consider you're a performer? Would you consider steroids? So they have a, a, a whole wellness policy over at the WWE because of, I think, what you are alluding to, where there is, you know, they drug test rather oh, often really? at the WWE. Yes, they, they actually oh. do. Now, there's always going to be people that talk about some people maybe aren't getting tested. There's always conspiracy theories about everything, but I've been tested and given my blood to the WWE numerous times. So now this isn't like, part of your stand up act. You're being serious, right? You're not 100 percent serious. Okay. <laughs> 100%, because it was, by the way, there was a lot of things that happened whenever you start injecting your body with stuff and people who are already maybe high energy or very emotional. And then there was some stuff that has happened through the evolution of human and the evolution of uh, WWE where they have had to put in different rules and evolve, hopefully, you know, and I, I think the wellness policy is a big one because of all the things that you are uh, kind of, I think, immediately thinking of. Now, with that being said, when I was in the NFL, and we'd see a guy walk into the locker room who was obviously on something that the rest of us would not take because of a failed test. There was an immediate chatter out of my brain. Like, well, as soon as I retire, I'm getting on whatever <laughs> that guy is on, you know, I'm getting on whatever that person's on. And you'd see somebody come you, walking in, just yoked out of their mind. I'm like, okay, so that's just what you're just drinking protein shakes and stuff. And then ha ha laugh. I'm like, I'm going to get into that. So I think as I've grown older, I have uh, found two things difficult to find in Indiana where I live. It's not just something you walk up to a corner store and say, Hey, I'm looking to look like this guy that walked into the locker room when I was playing. Yeah. What do I need to take? And also I think I'm, I'm starting to think more about life. You know, I thought I was going to die young for a long time. I was burning that thing from both ends real hard. I think it's well documented. I think everybody knows that. But now that I'm getting older, I'm trying to, you know, take care of myself a little bit. And I don't know if I just want to shove everything that horses take into their bodies into mine. But if science gets to a point where it's healthy and safe and it's not going to kill me too young, I will certainly take something that will make my metabolism be a, a little bit quicker like it used to be, my recovery time a little bit. But I haven't dove into those waters just yet dan patrick what what does your wife say when she sees you on stage you know with you know kind of showing off your body hey my wife's sweet man we just celebrated our second anniversary yesterday and uh yeah. thank you thank you paulie you had the uh the under oh i lost McAfee. big yeah. Lost yeah. big yeah oh you aren't the only one Paul. <laughs> you aren't the only one i, I think uh you know i i've always i don't know man i'm just a goer I always have been, Dan. Just go, 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 go. And I, I rarely have any beef with anybody because I'm not around long enough to have beef with anybody. I'm normally just in and out. Here we go. Uh, what's next? What's next? I've been very driven my entire life. I think anybody that's ever known me would know that I've been trying to become successful literally forever. So I'm always thinking like, what's next? What are we doing? Hey, how are we doing? Let's keep it moving. And my wife is the first person that ever like, I think tried to be like, hey, you're allowed to like hang out for a bit like you're allowed to like i'm not just gonna let you just walk out of my life like this is so she, i don't want to say she tamed 
you know, the stallion here, but she kind of did. She kind of, and she's a super supportive person of me. She understands that I've had these dreams a lot longer than we've ever known each other. So she is fantastic. Uh, she is a great cook though. So every once in a while I'll get into good shape. I'll be like taking care of myself and then I'll come home and there's just like these cinnamon rolls and like these chocolate chip cookies and all this stuff. And I am, I have no discipline. I will dive in there, Dan. So it's a team effort. So I think she's pumped about it all. Does she ever just say, shut up? Oh yeah. What are you talking about? (laughs) I mean, I've been with me for 35 years. I say it to me all the time. I I couldn't even imagine what she says. Uh, but yeah, you have a better body than Peyton Manning. So I think we could agree with that. Right. Yeah, well, I don't know. His body uh, took him to a Hall of Fame. I think he's a... Not his body of work, his body. Well, I mean, his body is his tool. What are you talking about? Do you no, see his those... mind. His mind. Oh, yeah, but have you... Those... Hey, those wobbly balls ain't going to throw themselves, man. <laughs> what do you think this is? No, uh, quarterbacks, I don't, I don't think... And it's kind of changing now with the evolution of offense and what quarterbacks can do. But back in the day, there was a lot of bad body quarterbacks, you know, and they actually like who? Quarter, all of them. You basically go through all of them bad body. I mean, because they wanted to keep their muscles loose like a basketball shooter or a golfer, like guys didn't want to get too yoked up because they thought they would mess up their throw. So now it's all of a, it's a little bit of a different game where guys got to take hits. And I think they're getting a little bit more yoked up, but I think Peyton had a, uh, a solid body and a body of work, obviously. Yes, he did. It's like Roethlisberger. Roethlisberger. He had big head syndrome. Go through them all. Any of those pocket quarterbacks probably had a hilarious upper body. I mean, I mean, the lower body is going to be strong. Core probably going to have to be strong, right? Because there's a lot of that and, um, you know, throwing. But normally arms, chest, traps, neck, pretty relaxed. And that's normally how people are uh, judging bodies or not. You know what I mean, Dan? Give me a, give me a double gunshot here before we go here. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Let me wake him up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wait. <laughs> it feels good, man. I'll tell you what. My knees are still sore, though. Uh, knees still sore. Uh, I I still gain like twenty five, thirty pounds and lose twenty five, thirty pounds like every two, three months when football season's coming around. Just like I'm still playing, uh, but I'm incredibly pumped about where life is, and I can't thank you all enough, honestly. Hey, congrats. No. For trailblazing in this world. And also, let's win it. Let's get you guys a damn Emmy. What are we doing? <laughs> Paul, Fritz, Seton, boys, what the hell is going on over there? How come these shows that are just Johnny come lately, okay? <laughs> Johnny come lately, childish stuff are winning Emmys and you guys aren't. What is the deal? We're, the, we're the Buffalo Bills of, of, uh, mm-hmm. of Emmys. No, you're not, because you guys have a kicker that's going to make the kick. Oh. And that, that happens every single time. I don't understand mm. what the deal is. What yeah. is, just, is it because you're too handsome, Dan? You think it's because you're too handsome? Oh, gosh. That's what they've told me that before. That, yeah. I th- so, I, you're right. I mean, it's yeah. like, you know, you don't want to have a comedian who's good looking. You know? Not relatable. Yeah, right. See? So, so you are too handsome for sports I think talk. So, so. I think even so. though your show, how many years? How many years have you been doing this? Uh, well, we've been together sixteen years since I left the mothership. How? How do? You, how have you done sixteen off seasons? I just got through what my third one. Oh my god! There Every is no day. off season. Yes, there is. Are you? Ta- I, I was trying to find out what I heard that a jury or a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich. That's what I was told, okay? I'm trying to learn these legalese stuff. And then for two, three weeks, I'm talking about litigation. I have no idea about any. I don't know how you did it, Dan. You're too smart. I'm not smart enough for it all, pal. I have no uh, idea. Tell AJ I said hello. Congrats again. Great to talk to you, buddy. Thank you so much for having me. It's always an honor. I will tell AJ, and I'm sure he says hi. That's Pat McAfee, host of the Pat McAfee Show, co-hosted by uh, AJ Hawk.